All right, good afternoon and good evening, everyone, again. Um, I'm Nathan Silver. I'm the Sales Engineering Manager, focused on the, R on the RTMS and Blue products here at uh, Image Sensing Systems. We're going to go ahead and get the webinar started now. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to today and, and thank you for your time and, and, and coming to listen to us. Uh, hopefully, we will share some information with you that you can use uh, in helping your customers uh, and agencies around the world uh, help solve their traffic problems. Uh, we are recording today's webinar. Uh, it will be available for offline playback. So for those of you who either missed or had issues with the audio uh, today, uh, you can feel free to, to listen to this at any time offline. We're aiming for about 20, 30 minutes of, of content today, and then uh, we'll roll into a Q&A session at the end. Uh, the way we'll handle questions and answers is via the chat panel in, in the WebEx presentation. Uh, you can ask these questions anytime as they come up. Uh, we will be addressing them at the end during the Q&A session. So if something comes to mind, feel free to just uh, type it in right away so you, you don't lose your train of thought. And uh, we'll endeavor to answer pretty much every question uh, we can, uh, time permitted. So I wanted to start off with a little bit about me, and it's a little difficult to talk about yourself in the third person here, but uh, I joined EIS in early 2006, uh, so before uh, I, Image Sensing Systems uh, acquired EIS and the RTMS team uh, at the end of 2007. Well, I have a background in, in math, computer science, and electrical engineering, uh, so I came up through the engineering ranks and then moved into product management a number of years ago. Um, and now I'm uh, serving as uh, the sales engineering manager, uh, helping customers a little more directly here. Um, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. And uh, so I've been involved with the business for, for 11 years, and uh, ho hopefully I can lend my expertise and experience to, uh, to, to help you today. Image, sen image sensing systems and uh, the company they acquired, EIS, is, they've both been around for 25 years. They've uh, they were both the pioneers in the non-intrusive detection in both video and, and, the, and the radar fields, respectively. Uh, we're headquartered in St. Paul, Minnesota, in the, in the United States, uh, but we have offices in Barcelona, Toronto, and Bucharest, um, and we are a truly global company. Um, you can see on the map on the right there, uh, anything in, in the light blue are areas where we have uh, deployed either uh, autoscope video revision sensors uh, or our, the, uh, the RTMS sensors. Uh, moving along, we want to talk a little bit about uh, just a, a, a brief history of roads. So way back in the third or fourth century BC on the left there, um, that's a, a paved road uh, in Italy. Um, as, as the Dark Ages set in, we reverted to, to uh, dirt trails and, and horse-drawn carriages and buggies, um, and these carts got stuck in muds. And, and then as the Industrial Revolution came um, and population grew, um, we ended up getting some more paved roads again, and that started with cobblestones. Um, and then came the automobile. With a little bit more weight and a little bit more need for, for a, a solid and paved surface. Um, and then what we found is the automobile came and it kept coming. And we ended up with some pretty serious congestion on the roadways. As all this was going on, traffic engineers were faced with a number of questions. So what's happening on our roadways? Um, how many cars are there? So what's the total volume? Is there congestion? How congested is it? How long will it take to get from point A to point B? Um, the, the planning groups need to know, uh, do we need to add lanes to a road? Do we need to add more roads to, to, to add capacity for, for uh, a particular uh, origin destination pair? And that led to the advent of data gathering. And the very first data that was collected was called point data. And point data is a statistical measure. So these are all statistics. But they help us understand what's happening at one point in space at a particular point in time. So for example, right here, right on this particular roadway, this is the, the 401 in, in Toronto. So 
with a point detector there, we knew what was happening there, but we didn't know what was happening uh, elsewhere. There are different sources of point data. So everyone is familiar with loops. Uh, radar is also a source of point data. There are acoustic sensors and video sensors as well. And th these single sources of point data provide uh, a, a number of statistics like volume, occupancy, and even with a, a, a single um, detector, you can get speed and infer speed from, from, from a single presence. As the need uh, increased for uh, improved speed and gaining classification information, another point was added uh, and the same location, which gave us uh, a time delay between these two. And that, that, that again, it extended the point data to, to provide an improved speed and classification. But the real power, I think, starts to come here when we start looking at spatial data. As, so what is spatial data? Spatial data is also a statistical measure, but it helps us understand what's happening between two points uh, on a roadway. So again, here in the 401 in Toronto, if we look at this orange rectangle here, that, that's the section of, uh, of the freeway we're looking at. So you put... Um, a, a detector at the beginning and the end of that spatial segment. And those detectors are called probe detectors, and they're going to provide probe data. So it's another source of point data, but it doesn't provide the per lane data that traditional point detectors will provide. An example of a, a piece of probe data uh, is a unique identifier. So that's something that can be tracked along the roadway from point A to point B. Uh, the timestamp, which is when that particular uh, piece of data was captured. Uh, a GPS location, which tells you where that particular uh, data comes from. And then there's other additional data that can be achieved that depends on the technology. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about RSSI maybe a little bit today and, uh, and, and the dwell time or stay time, which is how long that particular probe was being detected at that particular point in time. As I said, probe data is a piece of point data uh, and that GPS location uh, identifies that particular data with a particular point. There are different sources of probe data. Uh, so there's floating car data, Wi-Fi detection, and Bluetooth detection. Uh, those are the three that we're just going to cover a little bit today. We're not going to cover the uh, the license plate or num number plate reads or, or the crowdsource data. So floating car data uses the mobile data network to track subscribers using GPS and the mobile data network. So what does that mean? So your cell phone, which is sitting in your pocket, or your in-car uh, navigation system um, is, is getting uh, GPS locations all, all the time. It's updating. So if you're using something like Google Maps on your phone uh, and using it to, to navigate through traffic, those GPS locations are being transmitted via your data network back to Google, uh, and they're, they're sort of tracking you along, and they're able to determine how long it takes you to, to traverse a particular route. And as you start to aggregate more and more and more of these tracks, uh, you get a, a better idea of what's happening on, on the roadway. Um, agencies can acquire this data. Um, it's not free, uh, so there is a recurring cost to that. Uh, in, in some regions in the world, uh, tracking people using their, their GPS uh, provides some potential privacy concerns. Um, if an individual doesn't have their mobile uh, or they've turned the GPS off or they don't allow an app to have uh, GPS access with, with the app in the background, uh, th th there's no data to be had. Um, likewise, in, in some rural areas where cell phone or mobile phone proliferation is not as high, uh, that also limits the amount of data that, that you can get in those areas.
Wi-Fi detection um, is a side of road detection uh, that passively listens for devices searching for Wi-Fi networks. Uh, there is also a way that those detectors can actively scan for Wi-Fi traffic and, and, and grab the MAC addresses. Um, but the most common way is to uh, is to listen for the for the beacon. So the, the Wi-Fi scan intervals generally about five seconds. Uh, it goes up from there if the user is not using their phone, and that, that's to save the battery. Um, the downside of this is if a vehicle is not in the detection area when that scan takes place. Uh, it won't be detected. So that's de depicted in the lower left corner there of, of, of the graphic that shows the Wi-Fi scan happening outside the detection area. Five seconds later, the vehicle's traversed through the Wi-Fi detection area uh, when it scans again. So that would represent a missed detection. Um, so that usually results in a, in a lower penetration rate uh, or a lower read rate, uh, which decreases the quality and, and amount of, of data which uh, affects the, the follow-on algorithms that provide the useful information from that. The other interesting uh, aside there is buses. So passengers on buses will usually have their phones open, so they'll be scanning more frequently. Um, now, if a bus happens to travel through and it's in that five-second window, you're going to get a lot of points uh, or a lot of detections, uh, and that can bias um, the travel time or, or, or whatever the, the algorithm is looking for uh, based on a single vehicle traveling through. That, that's exacerbated if uh, there's a bus lane uh, that, can, that can further contribute to, to, to data bias. Bluetooth detection. This is an active detection uh, method whereby a Bluetooth detection station, again, on the side of the road, um, is actively inquiring and trying to find Bluetooth devices that are in discovery mode. And like Wi-Fi, there are also ways to, to sniff the air or to listen for active Bluetooth traffic. Uh, it's, in, it's encrypted, but we're not interested in the, in the payloads. We're just interested in the MAC addresses. Um, now, the Bluetooth inquiry time is much, much shorter than the five-second Wi-Fi beacon interval. So it's about 1.4 milliseconds. And that's set in the Bluetooth standard. So there's a much higher chance that the device will be in the detection zone um, using Bluetooth detection over Wi-Fi. And that increases the penetration rate. And some of you may be wondering, well, why is my Bluetooth detection area much wider than it was for Wi-Fi? Uh, and that's part and parcel of the way uh, our Bluetooth detection antennas work. We, we use a, a directional and sectional antenna that uh, has a much, much wider uh, detection area uh, upstream and downstream on the roadway uh, in order to maximize detection rate. Applications. Where is uh, spatial data used? So one particular area is spatial data. So as we're able to match unique identifiers between two points on a segment or in a particular spatial area, um, we're able to determine very, very accurately how long it took uh, those particular people with those unique identifiers to travel that particular segment. Uh, the more matches we have, the more confident we are in our travel time calculation. Um, publishing those journey times or travel times on a VMS can help inform commuters. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this or a lot more about this in the case study um, in just a little bit. Uh, spatial data also gives you origin destination information. So origin destination falls into sort of two um, categories, local origin destination and global. So local is concerned with what's happening, just one sort of link up and down uh, in, in the network of, of segments, whereas global origin destination looks at the entire network. So with a local origin destination, uh, you can ask and, and answer questions like, uh, for, for people who enter the freeway at this interchange, uh, did they get off of the next interchange or do they keep going? Um, 
did they go upstream or downstream? Uh, with a global origin destination, uh, so this requires a, a, a much larger number of uh, detectors out there to, to give good information. Um, you can answer questions like, the, for the people who live in this neighborhood, where do they work? So you're looking at when, when people leave at 8 in the morning or 7.30 in the morning, um, where do they end up at 9 o'clock? Um, or the, the opposite, the people who work here or who arrive here at 9 o'clock, where do they come from? Uh, what neighborhoods do they live in? And that can help inform um, planners um, in both sort of roadway and uh, mass transit to, to, to understand, do they have appropriate capacity? Are they serving um, the, the neighborhoods uh, adequately to, to get commuters into where they need, uh, in, in need to work? A lot of really interesting applications in, in, in OD. But the real power comes in combining both the point and the spatial data. So probe data uh, has a, a more difficult time separating individual lanes, um, which is something that most uh, other traditional point detectors like loops or radar uh, are exceptionally good at. Um, so for instance, um, in, in Toronto here, this, this uh, image in the lower left corner this is a picture of the 401, so we have a, a core and collector or express and collector, both on the eastbound and westbound. So a, a traditional spatial data or, or, or probe data will know whether um, vehicles are traveling in a direction based on where they were matched, whether they match to the upstream or the downstream station. But they won't know which lane it's in or which group of lanes it's in. Uh, and that's where uh, getting a, a speed information from a, a point detector uh, can help hint at that algorithm and, and how to separate uh, the, the, the clouds of matches. I'm not going to talk at all, actually, about um, what the data looks like um, or, or, or how the algorithms work. Uh, we really just wanted to focus on the data today. But uh, if that's something you're interested in, uh, by all means, send us an email. There's an email address on, on the last slide of the presentation, and uh, we'll be happy to answer your question. Uh, likewise, in the upper right corner, uh, we're able, by combining the data, to, to separate out HOV, HOT, or hot lanes. Um, and sometimes those are dedicated bus lanes. Um, buses are a little easier to, to separate, in fact. Uh, we're able to separate, sometimes separate, uh, bus lanes uh, even without a, a point sensor. Uh, and that's based on a number of, of things in our algorithm. But uh, in general, uh, we want to be able to combine uh, the, the power of a, of a traditional point sensor like the RTMS uh, with, uh, with a spatial sensor to be able to, to provide travel times not only based on um, normal lanes but also on, on the HOV or hot lanes. The other interesting application here is deep learning. And this is an, a, an area of active research in uh, a number of places. Um, is what types of information can you get? Can you, looking at global OD data in real time through a deep learning algorithm, uh, detect incidents um, before any other method? Uh, I think this is an area of active research. but. Uh, it's something that we definitely wanted to mention as, as an opportunity uh, for, for agencies and, and, and consultants and, and researchers to, to consider. So moving on to the case study, um, from a panel discussion at the 2014 ITS Canada meeting in Victoria, BC, um, the City of Toronto presented uh, an, an interesting application of using Bluetooth travel times uh, to inform drivers uh, during a construction project. So the, the segment in question is the Gardner Expressway between uh, just west of the Humber Bay at the Lakeshore Split and, uh, and the Young Street exit. 
So there are two parallel routes that a, a driver could take uh, to, to get downtown uh, uh, from the Humber Bay. On the top there, the, the, the path that's outlined uh, follows the Gardner Expressway. That follows the, the orange freeway there that, that travels right, right into the downtown area. Uh, the alternate road uh, follows Lakeshore Boulevard. So there's an area to get off, and then you follow Lakeshore Boulevard down through through Exhibition Place and then and then on in, into the downtown core. So while the Gardener was under construction, uh, travel times were increasing, and, and commuters had their route pre-planned. They knew that they would take the Gardener, and they didn't even consider using the Lakeshore. Uh, but there was excess capacity, and the, the travel times were much lower if you were to take uh, the Lakeshore. So what the city did is they posted travel times, and I, I apologize for, for some of that sign being uh, being blocked out. But um, so you can see in this particular case, the traffic's free flowing, and the the, tra the commuters are told if you want to get to Young Street uh, via the Gardner, right now it'll take you 17 minutes, but if you take Lakeshore, it'll take 15 minutes. So that's an indication that uh, even though the Gardner is an expressway um, and the, the Lakeshore is um, as, a, as a regular road with, uh, with, with traffic lights, a, a signalized road, uh, it's quicker to take the signalized road than the expressway. So that would, would tell commuters that there's congestion ahead. Um, when they started this, they had commute times of uh, to Young Street via Gardner, 48 minutes via Lakeshore, 15 minutes. Uh, and what would happen is as commuters came in and saw this, uh, they would divert to Lakeshore and the travel times equalized. So they were able to optimize uh, the use of the roadways between this particular junction and, and the downtown core uh, simply by posting uh, the journey times via two, two available routes. So they didn't have any signalized, there was, there was no, no automatic prompt. It was just in, informing commuters and letting them make an intelligent decision um, based on on their knowledge, uh, and, and it worked quite well. So this was definitely a success story of using spatial data uh, to to optimize flow or minimize travel times along two parallel routes. Now, spatial data can't answer all the questions. Uh, so yes, travel times along the two routes were roughly equalized, um, but what were the side effects? Uh, was there a diversion uh, of uh, volume from one to the other? Um, in, in all likeliness, uh, although without having the data in hand, I can't say for certain that volume was diverted from the Gardner to the Lakeshore. So what impact did this have uh, on, on maintenance schedules, on the maintenance budget? And that's where the point data really comes, comes in is being able to have both spatial data and point data. And it just so happens that uh, we have available uh, a single sensor that combines both point and probe, which will give you the, the spatial data in a single deployment. So the RTMS SX300, uh, we have the most accurate per lane point sensor available um, from a sci-fi radar perspective on the market. We provide volume, occupancy, speed, classification, we can provide contact closure and a, and a number of a number of other statistics directly from the unit itself, and we've integrated directly into that um, a Bluetooth detector, and those are those two uh, vertical antennas on the bottom, um, and that's really the, we believe is the most advanced Bluetooth detector for traffic. It was purpose built, purpose designed. Um, there's two channels, uh, two readers, two antennas. Uh, they're directional. So what that means is we only detect um, in front of the sensor. So if you have a, a side fire configuration or a, a sensor on the side of the road with an omni omnidirectional antenna, uh, you're detecting traffic in the trees behind you or uh, in, in the houses uh, wherever your uh, your roadway goes, goes alongside. So th this was purpose built uh, and we have an incredibly high uh, reader penetration rate. Uh, so we're, we're very proud of this and uh, we look to this as uh, the product that will help drive uh, more data for, for the algorithms that provide both point and, uh, and spatial data. 
And with that, uh, we've come to the end of the material. Um, and I would like to open this up for Q&A. So I'm just looking over at uh, the uh, Q&A panel here, and I'm just waiting to see whether anybody has any questions. So we'll just wait a couple of minutes for some questions to come in, and then, uh, okay. So my colleague, Lisa, who's our uh, marketing communications manager, says that there are no questions at the moment. Um, we'll just wait another another minute here. We're in that 20 to 30 minute range uh, where we, I thought we were going to be, and uh, just want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to, to to think about any questions. I know, especially since we just posed that last uh, um, had that last slide up with, with our product, but uh, let's give a few more minutes. Another minute. It looks like there may be a question in the Q&A panel. Just give me a moment here. So there is a, a question in the Q&A panel, and uh, the question is, will the camera be available in the SX300BT? Um, and at this particular juncture, uh, I'm disappointed to have to say that, uh, no, we're not able to offer both the camera and uh, the BT in, in the same uh, enclosure. There's just there's just not enough room in the enclosure to uh, to accommodate uh, all of the electronics. I'm sorry about that. All right. And if there's nothing else. I think everyone's had a, an opportunity to to pose their questions. If you do think of anything, um, we're here to help. Uh, if you have a specific project or design or something you need, you need help with um, or something that we didn't cover that you think of later, please send us an email, uh, info at imagesensing.com. Uh, someone uh, in your region, we'll we'll uh, we'll be able to get back to you. So if uh, if you are in a, in, a, in our EMEA region, uh, someone in, uh, in in EMEA will will get back to you. Likewise in North America. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, if you have any feedback, by, by all means, also send that into info at imagesensing.com. Uh, we're always looking to uh, to improve the the content and the webinars that we're presenting. And uh, at that, I wish uh, everyone uh, a very good day.